the woodlands and tropical rainforests of Tanzania. There it was where anthropologist and primatologist Jane Goodall started to learn about the behavior of humans' closest relatives, the chimpanzees. She discovered that they too have personalities, that they experience emotions like joy and sorrow, and that they are also using tools. And she thus revolutionized the way we think about ourselves, about humankind, as not being the only species capable of the above. And we're very delighted to have her here today. Hello, Mrs. Goodall. Such a pleasure to meet you. Well, hello, and it's lovely to meet you as well. At the Kultur Symposium Weimar, everything revolves around the topic of generations. Let's take a look at your long-standing object of your, this, your studies, the chimpanzees. What defines the relationship between young and old chimpanzees? Well, it's basically the fact that the younger ones are submissive to the older ones. Uh, but it's, they have such a complex society that they move around in small, ever-changing groups And so the problem for a young male, at one moment he may be dominant over the females in the group because that's how, you know, gradually males become the dominant sex. But then suddenly an older male may arrive and suddenly the young male's got to learn to be very submissive, just like that. So it's a, it's a complex society and very fascinating. It's complex and totally different from human society and its organization, right? Well, human societies are arranged in so many different ways. And there are some hunter-gatherer and indigenous groups that are not unlike the way chimpanzees are organized. But <laughs> certainly in our Western society, it's very different, yes. Have you observed any typical intergenerational conflicts among chimpanzees apart from this domination struggle that there is between the male ones? Well, you know, the most fascinating ones, it, it's basically the same thing, but it's very fascinating to see the tremendous conflict as a young brother tries to take over at a certain age from his older brother in the dominance hierarchy. And this reminds me so much You know, of a lot of lot of stories you read in history about the the battle between brothers taking over the throne, a kingdom, and so on. So it's it's uh, it's, it's very very similar, really, between them and us. Your own son spent parts of his uh, childhood in Gombe National Park in Tanzania alongside several families of chimpanzees with new generations of humans and chimpanzees growing up side by side. Please tell us more about this period uh, of life and the interlocations in a way. Well, we had to keep our son very separate from the chimpanzees because they are meat eaters and they have been known to take human infants. But what was fascinating for me was comparing my son's development with that of a young chimp who's exactly the same age and looking at similarities and differences in, in their motor skills and their, you know, their cognitive abilities. That was fascinating to me. And I wanted to make it a scientific study, but somehow when it's your own child, the science went away and it was just observing and having fun with him, just like chimpanzee mothers do. <laughs> yeah, that is maybe a diff what what makes you different from other sociologists uh, in the past that have used their child for their experiments. But I'm shocked by them. I'm shocked by them. <laughs> yes. Um There was a study recently published in the magazine Diversity and Distributions where 60 scientists uh, described or uh, uh, made a model that 85% of the today's habitat from apes uh, will not be habitable till 2050 anymore because uh, with climate change and uh, the woodlands being cut off and burned that uh, there will not be much uh, space left for them. What exactly is being lost there if we lose the habitat of uh, different uh, apes? Well, it's not just the habitat of apes, it's um, the habitat in general. And the point is that we are part of and not separate from the natural world. In fact, we depend on the natural world. We depend on it for helping us obtain clean water and clean air. We depend on it for food and shelter. 
But what we depend on is healthy ecosystems. And a healthy ecosystem is comprised of the biodiversity, the different plant and animal species that make it up. And if you imagine it like a tapestry and each species as it becomes extinct, it's like pulling a thread from that tapestry. And if you pull out enough threads, because one species may be dependent on another for food, so one disappears, the other will too, and so on and so on. So in the end, your tapestry is hanging in tatters and we depend on healthy ecosystems. So it's a bad lookout for the future if we allow this, this climate change and biodiversity to continue as it is now. What is worsening the problem is that some parts of the tropical rainforests and the woodlands are being burned down to, uh, in order to plant soybeans for uh, to, to nourish cattle or just for uh, for cattle to to grow up there. Um, you are a vegetarian, and you say if everyone would stop eating m animal products, it would change the world. What exactly would happen? Well, the thing is, <clears throat> since I've been lockdown here in England, I've actually been able to be vegan, you know, giving up eggs and milk and things. But the main point here is that we are, we have become in the Western world reliant on cheap meat. And so people are eating way too much meat. And by demanding cheap meat, it means billions of animals are confined in these terrible factory farms. And many animals are just let loose into the environment where they destroy forests and woodlands. And the harm to the environment is unbelievable. So more grain is grown to feed animals than, to, and, and at the same time, there are people starving around the world with not enough to eat. And also we're using up an awful lot of food for biofuels. So we've got to come to some better relationship with the natural world. We've got to stop intensive farming. We've got to, if people must eat meat, then animals must be farmed responsibly and humanely. And that's not happening now. Oh, say people, it will cost more. It will cost a bit more, but then you value it more. And the shocking thing today is the food that we waste. Mm -hmm. And the good news is there are many alternatives now to eating this cheap meat that, well, at the moment it's still expensive, but they've worked out how to grow meat from cells. And so no animals would need to be tortured. And it is torture. These factory farms are being called concentration camps for animals. And that is so true. Also, all these animals are producing methane gas, which is one of the main greenhouse gases causing climate change. And all this huge areas destroyed to grow grain to feed the animals is causing massive loss of biodiversity. So it's all linked together. Plus, you know, our disrespect of animals actually led to the pandemic, which is still raging in some parts of the world. Wow, that was a fierce <laughs> argument or a whole lot of fierce arguments for uh, lessening the consumption of animal products. How? Do you find how realistic is that, that uh, the, the global human population is going to accept this? Well, there is a growing movement of vegetarianism and veganism. It's growing fast in many, many countries. And I think, you know, people, there's a lack of understanding here. And I think that's, that's why I was traveling 300 days a year around the world. And that's why I've been on Zooms like this every day since lockdown began. I mean, it's totally exhausting, much worse than traveling. And spending a huge amount of my time developing the Jane Goodall Institute's Roots and Shoots program for youth, from kindergarten, university, everything in between. And they are gradually coming to understand not only the harm that we do to the environment with this intensive farming, but they, they understand that animals are sentient beings. The chimpanzees helped me to prove that to science. And every single one of these factory farmed animals, every one of these animals that's captured and trafficked around the world to sell as meat or as exotic pets or medicine around the world that led to COVID-19, yes. every single one of those animals 
is a sentient being capable of feeling happiness, fear, terror, despair, and pain. Let's turn from the animals to you and your personal professional career. You were a pioneer. Over time, you have become an inspiration for generations of women in science and research. What were the challenges that you faced at the beginning of your career in uh, the 1950s? 1960s, actually. Well, it, it sort of began when I was a child. I was 10 years old when I dreamed of going to Africa, living with wild animals and writing books about them. I had no idea of being a scientist because women didn't do that sort of thing. And everybody laughed at me. But you see, I had a wonderful and supportive mother, which made a huge difference. A mother who said to me, if you really want to do something like this, you're going to have to Uh, work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity. And if you don't give up, you'll find a way. So, okay, I saved up, finally got to Africa, met Louis Leakey. He offered me the chance of studying chimpanzees. Nobody had done it. Nobody knew anything about wild chimpanzees. And after I'd been there one and a half years, Leakey told me I had to go to university, even though I'd never been to college, to do a PhD. And I was told I'd done everything wrong. I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. I couldn't talk about their personalities, minds capable of problem solving, or their emotions like happiness, sadness, fear, because those were unique to humans. Well, I'd been taught as a child by my dog that that wasn't true. The chimpanzees only emphasized it. I mean, we share 98.6% of our DNA with them. And then all the behaviors, kissing, embracing, holding hands, swaggering, throwing rock, having a kind of primitive war, but also showing love, compassion, and altruism. They're just so like us. Mm -hmm. um, so I just went on talking about what I knew. And luckily, my, my first husband, his film began uh, reaching out into the scientific world. And then they just had to believe. But I never confronted them. I just quietly went on writing about things the way I knew was correct. <laughs> uh, and you changed uh, your topic of uh, investigation and how it is investigated. Um, in your opinion, what are the main uh, challenges that women are facing today in the professional or also in the sci scientific world today? Well, it, it varies from country to country, but All I, all I can really say on that is the change since I was a young woman is huge. There are far, far more uh, women in science now. I know it's tough in some places, there's unequal wages and unfair discrimination, but it is gradually improving and there are more and more groups fighting for equality. And what I love is a saying by an indigenous person in, I think it was Ecuador, And he said, our tribe is like an eagle and one wing is male and the other wing is female. And only when the two wings are equal will we fly high. Mm -hmm. um, and in your opinion, what are the biggest problems that the young generation is facing today? <laughs> problems caused by us, by our absurd idea that there can be unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources and a growing human population and a growing population of livestock so that we're destroying forests with all their biodiversity. We're polluting the ocean with all their biodiversity. And those are the lungs of the world, giving us oxygen, absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And, you know, we've polluted the air. We're doing monoculture, agriculture, and poisoning the land, poisoning the soil. And we, we are, and we have been stealing the future of our young people for years and years and years. And if we don't stop, if we don't get together and find a better relationship with the natural world, then for my great, great grandchildren, it will be a very sad world indeed. Indeed, we as a species are not exempt from extinction if we carry on with business as usual. Thank you very much, Dan Goodall, for your clear words and uh, for the work that you do. Enjoy your day.
Well, thank you. But I, I want to say the last word that I do have hope for the future, the energy of young people, the resilience of nature, the amazing human brain. There is hope, but we've got to act now. Thank you very much. Thank you for your optimism. Thank you.